In a moment, I will explain this circuit schematic for the lift that features in my previous video. The cab is completely original and dates back to the 1920s. The unique feature is that there are only two buttons up and down. There are no call buttons on the landings. Therefore, if you leave the lift on a different level, then you will have to walk up the stairs to get it. To see the full video, please click on the link above or see the video description. This video is all about how the lift works, using the diagram that was left in the motor room. This diagram is dated 1977. As explained in a previous video, although the lift originally dates back to the 1920s, this diagram closely matches the lift, in particular the slip ring motor configuration. A slip ring motor is, well, clever. But to get a full appreciation of it, which will also help you understand this video better, please click the link above to see a video dedicated to it. Let's start in the top corner, which is where the incoming three-phase main supply comes into the cabinet. These phases create voltages totaling 415 volts AC. This is for the motor, which I'm coming back to, and it also feeds this big transformer that provides other voltages to other circuits in the cabinet. 415 volts in, and then there are two windings providing a separate 12 volts and 122 volts AC. The 122 volt supply first goes around the safety circuit, which are various switches that will prevent the next part of the circuit working if activated. These are mainly over travel switches and stop buttons. If all of these are in the normal conditions, then the 122 volts finds its way to this device, a bridge rectifier. This converts AC to a DC voltage. In the UK, the AC main supply cycles 50 times per second. One cycle is represented by these red dots. The bridge rectifier inverts the negative voltage into a positive voltage, so that the sine wave that used to go up and down now only goes up. This creates a DC voltage. The voltage still peaks and falls, which is now double the speed of a normal AC cycle. This is what you can normally hear when a noisy relay coil hums like this. Sorry about the jump scare there. Why do we need a bridge rectifier? It's because components such as relays and the motor's brake release work best on a DC voltage. These yellow lines represent the 110 volts DC voltage, which supplies the majority of the cabinet. This comes off the other side of the bridge rectifier. Let's follow it around to the brake release circuit. To create the circuit to release the brake, firstly requires either the main up relay contactor or the main down contactor to be active. This means the lift has been commanded to go up or down. As a backup, the brake is only released when the main contactor is also active. Now the brake can release, which is this large device at the end of the motor. The actual motor voltage is separate and explained in a moment. As I explained in the previous video, the majority of this diagram is for a different lift. There are no call buttons or direction logic. If you press the up button, it goes up. If you press the down button, it goes down. It's as simple as that. If you had call buttons, then there must be some logic involved. So the lift can decide whether it needs to go up or down to reach the call. For a lift with call buttons, here is how the logic works. Switches are set depending where the lift is. In this animation, they are in the shaft. But manufacturers also came up with clever ways to represent the same switch system in the motor room. If a call is placed above the lift, then the circuit is filtered through these switches to command the lift to go up or down to reach that call. Here, all the calls above the lift would send the car upwards. That's logical, right? 
but before microprocessors and software controlled lifts, everything had to be represented mechanically. As the lift passes a floor, the floor switch is reversed until the switch with the active call is found, which stops the lift. Looking at the mechanical logic switches now, any call below the lift now links up with the down direction, whilst calls above the lift still command the lift to go up. This is really diverting off the main topic of the 1920s lift diagram. But floor selector systems are fascinating. Different manufacturers did this in different ways. Instead of putting the switches in the shaft, for maintenance purposes, it was easier to deal with them in the motor room. This is the Schindler wheel selector. The system uses the inside switches to find the direction of a call. A track in the middle of the wheel pings each roller switch up or down. Express lifts had this rotary selector. Otis had this carriage. But let's have a look at this one in particular. This is from a lift that's even earlier than the lift featured in this video. It's dated 1905. This type of floor selector is probably closer to the selector that would have been used in this lift if there had been landing call buttons. You can of course find links to all these videos explaining how each system works in the video description. As this goods lift doesn't have call buttons, this whole section is for a different lift. Here is the bit that does exist. That's the up and down buttons inside the lift car because that's all it has. Moving to the right, these are a collection of timer circuits, but it's these that I want to focus on. When the main contact is activated, two timers are activated together. These are SCT1 and SCT2. SCT1 delays the first slip ring motor relay for one and a half seconds. After a further one and a half seconds, timer SCT2 activates relay SC2. Relays SC1 and SC2 control the slip ring motor, which is coming up in a moment. Now let's have a look at the top. Keeping in mind SC1 and SC2 are delayed when the motor starts up for one and a half seconds each. Now we follow the three phase mains towards the direction of the motor. There are several file safe systems to prevent the motor being powered up by accident. There are power switches, circuit breakers, and limit switches. If these are normal, then phase one and phase two are swapped over, depending if the lift is going up or down. This has the effect of creating a magnetic field going clockwise or anti-clockwise to make the lift go up or down. The three coils on the motor must first form a circuit before the motor will do anything. As a failsafe, the main contactor breaks phase two and three, preventing a circuit being formed. This is required because if any of the contactors were to get stuck, the lift would still stop when the main contactor turns off. Now the motor has power, let's move on to the slip ring part of the motor. Connections D, E and F originate from separate windings from inside the motor itself. They do not connect to any part of the incoming three phase main supply that runs the motor. Instead, these terminals generate their own power, which is transferred from the main motor windings, and depending on how they are connected together, can boost the motor to generate more torque during the startup. I'm well aware that this brief description of how a slip ring motor works is very vague, so I'm taking this opportunity to remind you that I created a separate video which goes through how it works in such a way that anyone can understand. There is a link to it at the end of the video. Now we come to the contactors SC1 and SC2. If you remember, these are both linked to timers and both delayed by one and a half seconds each when the motor received power, connecting D, E and F together, but via three separate resistors. 
After one and a half seconds, SC1 activates. These can be adjusted to provide more or less resistance for fine tuning by moving these rings up or down. This configuration creates the torque advantage to get the motor up and running. One and a half seconds later, SC2 activates, which causes all three resistors to be shorted out. With no resistance at all in the circuit, terminals D, E and F are now connected together to create a conventional caged motor, which is best for normal running. When the lift arrives at a floor, or in this case when the operator of the lift takes his finger off the up or down button, You've overshot the floor! <laughs> SC1 and SC2 are deactivated, followed by the main contactor. Yes, this is complicated, but it's quite simple at the same time. To make sense of it, now let's have a look at the motor running and the sequencing of the main contactor, then SC1 and SC2. You'll also have to bear in mind that I don't think that this sequencing is working in the right way. The timing between SC1 and SC2 should be one and a half seconds. But you can yeah. see here that it happens in almost an instant which doesn't really give the motor its torque advantage, which is the whole idea of installing a slip ring motor in the first place. Once the stator has power, the rotor is ready to turn. One and a half seconds later, the RC contactor connects all windings together, but forcing them through three resistors. This limits the amount of current being shared from winding to winding, creating the torque or magnetic grip advantage to get the motor running. One and a half seconds later, RC1 contactor creates a short circuit before the resistors shorting them all out. This creates the conventional caged motor configuration for normal running. I take a lot of time and effort to bring you quality, interesting videos. I'm all about quality, not quantity. I hope you enjoyed watching this video. If so, please consider subscribing to the Mr. Matt and Mr. Che channel.